Welcome, Pat, and happy Friday. Welcome to the Rick Helps Real Estate Show, otherwise known as the Mick Report. Yep. Hey, Rick, how you doing, buddy? Masters. I show my price mortgage T-shirt off. Yes, yes. Uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll just call that T-shirt pre-litigation. Yeah, with Gatorade. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get hot water with Gatorade. Yeah, well, that means somebody noticed it, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So... I don't have a, I got to talk with Jessica. We don't have t-shirts, so we got to, we got to get on that, you know? Yeah. I, I hear it. But uh, she may pop in, um, in a moment, she's picking up one of her kiddos at school. And uh, we might also have Jason Maggard pop in from the Pacific Northwest. Cause he's got some very interesting numbers that kind of tie into what, what I'm talking about today. And you've, and we're all seeing the same thing. In other words, nobody knows what's going on right now. We've got, uh, right here with our Cromford index that uh, we're seeing small improvements in the market for certain sub markets. So you can see all the green here, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 of them have improved versus last week in favor of sellers. You're really biting off a, a challenge. If you're down here in Queen Creek, Maricopa and Buckeye, especially Buckeye, if you're trying to sell a resale home, amongst all the new builds out there, you're having a tough time. Yeah. Um, and so they're, they're getting, they're getting hammered. Chandler is still in the winning column. And we see that every time we show a home in Chandler and realize we're not the only ones who want to write an offer on that home. So those guys are doing okay. Um, and then I've got an affordability report here to show you. And here's kind of where I thought we were going to be, Pat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I read a Facebook post this morning that went up and then immediately came down that that listings went up by 800 today. And, you know, call me. We've got a lot more inventory. And I'm looking and going, they only went up <coughs> 100 homes for the whole week. <laughs> We're down here at 15,579. Go back and look at last week's show. It was 15,479. And we have flatlined. So, you know, there is chatter. Oh, we're not a lot of new listings coming up. No, we don't. We don't. We flatlined. <laughs> and here is, you know, and I'm not trying to argue with anybody. I just think here's the numbers. Um, yeah. Uh, new listings popped up. Okay. A little bit. Actually got about 4,100 today. That's that's a little um, higher than average. But, and then we started coming down. I thought, Ooh, here we go. Well, we came back up when I added today's numbers in there in the seven days. So. Still 74, 75% um, respectable. Um, now, if we get up to 19,000 and we drop below 3,000 contracts, it's price reduction time across the board. And I'm going to show you where the price reductions are happening today as well. Hey there, Rick here. If you're thinking about moving to the Phoenix area or any of the surrounding communities, be sure and hit that subscribe button below so that you can be the first to know about the current market conditions. If you're thinking about moving in nine days or nine months, Jessica and I would be happy to help you understand the Valley of the Sun. All of our contact information is in the information below. And if you have any questions, be sure and reach out. Um, here's the change in monthly average price per square foot by price range. Over 10 million, 23.1% average price per square foot. Huge. For some reason, the three to five million range is not performing very well. Um, now, when you see something over 10 million and you have an average price here, that may only be two homes. So, you know, it's hard to tell. But if you get down here uh, in the uh, median area here, you know, with between 350 and 400, they're up 5.8 percent monthly and uh, 506,000, 3.9. So prices are bucking what everybody thought we would see and they're going up. Hello, Stephanie. Welcome. Hey, Stephanie. So are those monthly? Uh, so change in monthly average is that month over month? Uh, yes. Yeah. So monthly average price per square foot. So wait, somebody has joined us. We'll see what happens here in a second. It's probably good old Jessica. So she, we don't see your picture there yet. So I'm not going to add you to the page. Um, I will turn the camera on. <laughs> Number of price changes. This, look at this. Enormous, right? These are homes over 3 million. They tend to stay on the market much longer, and their price reductions are usually spread out over many months. But 
not this year. They just, woo, they're lowering them like crazy. So they started out too hot, I think. Yeah. This one's worth spending a little time on. Jessica, I see you down in the green room there, but uh, I don't see a camera or um, your mic's working, but your camera's not up there yet. So I'll patiently wait for that to pop in there and we'll put you on the show. Okay, this goes through city by city here, Pat. And and it's showing us um, that uh, no camera, Jessica says. Uh, reboot. Reboot. Um, Anthem has green supply which means it's limited the market is still green at 150.3 and the demand is slightly tamped down now when you bounce around here this is what i mean we've got all these mixed signals so yeah i mean you know if you go to buckeye you can see what the problem is there their supply is much higher than anybody else that's why it's red their overall market index is red and their demand index is red so they're getting the one two three punch on every wow. criteria there. They're just getting hammered. Well, when you go to Chandler, their supply is really low. Their market is good. Their demand is slightly lower. So that's why they're at 219.5. You just go next door to Gilbert and you see similarly the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. The Glendale. What about Maricopa? Okay. That one's going to jolt you here. Let's look at Maricopa. Look at that supply. There is. Too much supply, and the demand is low. So the demand is right there with everybody else, but there's a lot of supply out there. So that's what's hurting you. That's why you got a market index of 68. It's kind of cool um, to see different in indexes, indis indices that like this. Yeah, Phoenix, their supply is slim. Uh, their demand is low. Now, look at it. You had demand index of 69 here. What do we see in Maricopa? Maricopa had 82. So Maricopa, believe it or not, has more demand than Phoenix, right? When you look at that graph. Mm -hmm. But um, their supply is so much worse um, in Maricopa. I mean, it's so much, it's greater. Phoenix has got a shortage of supply. So but Queen Creek, Creek. Is a similar thing. Their supply, they have a lot of supply. They're sitting there with a demand index of 75. So they end up with uh, a market index of 75.2. Scottsdale. Oh, wait! You look at the over fifty-five ones here in a moment. Supply in Scottsdale is slim. Um, the demand is fairly good, almost what you consider normal, and uh, they end up an index of one thirty-two. Now let's go to the over fifty-five areas. You'd think they'd all be the same, right? They are not. Sun City, their supply is uh, almost normal. Their market index is low at 77.2, but their demand is really low at 68.7. Go next door, Sun City West. You see just a little bit of improvement, except their supply is considered balanced and their demand is low. Their demand is 75.3 compared to 68.7. So it's higher, but they have a Sun little Lakes. supply. Sun Lakes, whole different animal here, my friend. Their supply is very thin. So they end up with a higher supply index, and their demand index is almost normal. It's at 94. Again, I'll click back. There's 75. So Sun Lakes is doing well. If you're thinking of listing in Sun Lakes, people tend to go, well, you know, the snowbirds are gone. List it. They're moving. It's interesting to see. How's oh. Levine's index? I've been asked here. Let me check. Levine. 73.1, their supply is slightly low. Their demand is lower uh, than average, uh, but their overall market index is considered balanced. So you don't see one common theme across the valley, Pat. It's just no. not just not there. Uh, that's mean, how regional real estate is. Well, you take you compare that to 0809 when we everything was just falling like a rock everywhere. You just saw this all boats rise with rise and fall with the tide. And it's such a, in my new word of the, of the year is bifurcated. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and at, in 08, 09, you saw just one massive, you know, million dollar homes, 250,000 homes just going down, but it's such a segmented market. Now it's just, it really is quite uh, interesting. Well, it's good timing because we have Jason joining us from Tacoma, Washington and Jason's got some interesting numbers to share in that area. How are you, Jason? I'm doing good, guys. Nice to see you. 
How you doing? Here. So, so you're, it looks to me, you've hit the affordability wall and it looks like it's starting to affect a few things out there. And uh, you sent me this chart showing that in 2022, you had new listings in April 682 and you sold 1,138. That That's pretty hefty. But now you got 1,152 new listings and you're only moving 820. And your acting inventory has gone from a half a month to 2.5 months. That's not an alarming number to me, 2.5. But I think what you're showing is it's changing pretty rapidly out there for you guys up there, isn't it? Yeah, and kind of just like you were showing on, on your charts, we're a bifurcated market as well. The Seattle King County area is is always just so steady, you know, throughout all the decades that I've followed it. I'm down here in Pierce County, which is the second largest county. And um, we're starting to notice the, yeah, the price points and the payments is just too much for everybody down here. And and what you, I know that 2.5 months doesn't sound like a lot, but we've come from about a one to one and 0.5 months just in the last few months. And it's occurring in the springtime, which is up here, usually months of inventory shrinks uh, early winter or uh, winter to spring. And then it starts loading up later in the summer. So with this, this load up right now, we're adding inventory. I know the numbers don't look anything compared to you guys. You have, you know, eight, 10 times the amount of inventory we have, but um, I think we're going to be seeing three, four months inventory. I'd even be willing to predict five months inventory by September, October, because our demand drops off so much by then. And I don't see what we haven't had for the last five years is occurring right now. We're having inventory come on that is outstripping demand. Even, even though demand is pretty decent this year compared to last year, nothing like 2021 and 2022, but yeah. Can I ask you a question? Real quick, yeah, Jason. Are you you know here in the news that you know tech companies obviously employment numbers down here. We we have obviously technology Intel down here, and you've got obviously a lot of tech. Um, yeah, it just seems to me like tech is quietly laying off people. I mean, you hear numbers. Are, are you seeing that up there? Or I mean, are they? What's the employment situation? Layoffs overall? Yeah, I actually, have a couple good friends that are <laughs> one that's really high up at Microsoft, one that's high up at Amazon. And although they announce the layoffs, a lot of times they're shifting to those people to another division, or they actually even work with other tech companies and they're moving them over to other companies. So almost nobody's like just straight up losing a job and then out there in the market nervous. So it seems like there's enough other demand in these other new tech companies that all these people that make these wonderful $200,000 a year plus salaries, they, <laughs> they're, they're able to find work. <laughs> pretty easy. Well, if they can get it. And it, you know, and it just ties back to this affordability study that I got. That's the, who put this on? It's uh here's Seattle, Washington, uh, 669,000. Let me see what this chart means here for a moment. Um, local medium home sales price, annual mortgage payment, income needed. So let's look at the median price here and then income needed. So if I go to uh, and it's not going to list uh, Pierce County, but it, here's Phoenix. Mm -hmm. Here's the average price, four thirty-eight. Income needed, one hundred twenty-three thousand. Go to Seattle, and it's going to say six sixty-nine, and the income needed one hundred eighty-eight thousand. So it all boils down to this map in the United States that says there's only four states where it's affordable. Everybody <laughs> else is the same color. And I was commenting with Pat earlier before the show started about, you know, I keep seeing this repeated Facebook post that's out there because Facebook is where you go uh, uh, to get accurate information, as I'm sure you know. <laughs> and then the rest, of course, is uh, TikTok. Um, yep. I mean, I know if, if I want to get serious data, um, I scroll through my phone on TikTok. I don't have TikTok. So... This one's out there. This one's everywhere. So I'm not, uh, um, um, you just missed me on Chandler. I'll show you again in just a moment here, Neelam. Um, in 1978, 78, the interest, 71, the interest rate for mortgages was 7.33. If you waited for rates to go down, you would have purchased a home, wouldn't have purchased a home until 19, 
93, you would have rented for 22 years, waiting for rates to go down. Meanwhile, the value of real estate quadrupled. Don't buy real estate. Don't wait to buy real estate. Buy real estate and wait. Are you ready for it? Marry the house, date the rate. <laughs> okay, well, back then, I'll bet you the United States didn't look like this when it no. came to unaffordability. And so it's, I I don't like, those are, I don't know but who it's came like up the analogy. with that. Well, just to jump in, it's like, then, yeah, just the same thing. Like people say, well, I, when I bought my first house, rates were at 18%, but yeah, you were buying a $95,000 starter home, you know, four bedroom, three bath house. Now they're four ninety five. dollars yeah. You're comparing yeah. apples and zucchini. Yeah, it's um, uh, the, uh, yeah. it just drives me crazy. It's, uh, um, I want to look at, I can't look at Ocotillo. Um, Jason wanted to say like something to actually jump in. Go ahead, Jason, while I look this up. Yeah, that's something I think that's not brought up enough is the affordability index compared to where this market is going to go. Um, that's a really great point because my parents, they didn't own a house when we lived in Seattle, but we rented and they actually managed some small apartment complexes. And people back in the late 60s, early 70s, a lot of people made around five to ten thousand dollars a year. Yeah. And houses, houses were twenty thousand dollars, twenty five thousand dollars. Like <laughs> Um, we, my parents could easily afford rent and we could go on vacations and just don't, my dad had a, a job, a low level job at the gas company. Cause he was finishing up his college degree. Uh, we live, we lived in an apartment in an area now where the apartments go for 5,000 a month and the houses are 2.5 million. And we were a little family of four, you know, like it, so it's not even the same. There's no way, like <laughs> no, nobody you know, nobody with two little rugrats running around is making, you'd have to make a half million now to live the lifestyle we lived, you know, 50 years ago in Seattle. Yeah. So. Well, not to mention now back then, you know, I mean, mom stayed home to raise us. And uh, now the cost of daycare, I don't know how people can afford this at all. I remember uh, we were in a little tiny house and I remember this. It's weird that it's still in my brain. I think I must have been four, maybe five. I I think. But my mom told us we were living in a small little two bedroom house. And she told us that we were going to be moving and putting the house up for sale because we needed a bigger house. And I just looked up and I said, I've still got lots of room. <laughs> I was thinking we were moving because we were all getting too tall. Um, <laughs> yeah, big, but, bigger. <laughs> which Lisa's grandson, uh, he's five. And, uh, and he asked her, he goes, how tall will you be when you're a <laughs> hundred? <laughs> That's depressing. Cause I used to be over six, two, and now I'm barely over six, one. So I don't want to think yeah. about that. <laughs> well, he thinks we just keep growing. <laughs> Here's what I see in Ocotillo. Um, our day months of supply are up to 3.1, 2.4, um, in February. They're only updating here in March. I don't have April yet. That'll show up next week. So comparatively, back here in the silly season of 2021, you were a half a month. But uh, it really boils down to, again, the uh, supply and demand as we look at it on the, on the pie charts. And so Ocotillo's doing doing well. Um it's so always going to do. I mean, you got Intel down there. I mean, that, it's going to be like a hotbed for several years with Intel just throwing up what they're throwing up down there. I, that's just my my two cents worth. Yeah, you say you're scared. You should have waited. House prices are going up there, my friend. They are not going down. I used to live in Ocotillo, and yeah. they are not they are not going down. Just just go down a little south there and just look to the west. Oh, that's a great big building there, and they keep adding to it. Intel. Yeah. 2015 bought my first property. It's a rental now for 150,000. Payments 750. I feel bad for these first-time home buyers paying about 23, 2500 for a starter home if they can get that. Now, having talked doom and gloom, I got we had a message from. Uh, remember the new program they came out with last week uh, here in Arizona, Pat, where they were offering, I think it was, I don't know how many millions for this. Uh, grant program but it was only in certain areas and tied to your income mm -hmm. um and i and it's they by the time you do the math 
it was supposed to help um, 500 families. And so I said, wow, okay, that's great. Um, so I asked the gentleman, I said, he said he was going to look into it. I said, let me know what they say. He said, I did meet with them. I qualify for the 80 to 120% of median home sales price in Tucson, which would still be helpful. In order to move forward, though, I would have to fill out the mortgage app with them and get the ball rolling on that, which I am not ready to do yet. They did say, don't expect this money to go far since they have received nonstop inquiries. So they're running towards it. And those type of programs don't last very long because they never throw enough money at it. You're mm -hmm. going to have 500 families in between Maricopa and Pinal counties. Um, it's going to be a bit of a dogfight. Do you guys have any of those kind of programs up there, Jason? We do. They're, they've always, they're the state bond and uh, Washington state housing finance, but you know, you've got to meet eight different parameters and you have to make, just too little and then for this part of it and this so it it's such a pain for the loan officers because they promote them big time like you said and they actually run out of funding usually by the funds get released january 1st and they're out by march every year well, of the it, funds for that so. yeah it ends up usually disappointing a lot of people there's i know there's one lender jason that yeah. uh is offering a, a grant for you know there's that home ready first program that i've been kind of uh, touting as far as uh different lenders but the one lender is given twenty five hundred. It's a smaller amount, but he said you got to you got to be fifty percent of the AMI, the uh, the area median income for Phoenix, and so that puts you at like I'm just throwing a number out forty five thousand dollars. I mean, good luck trying to find a house for forty five thousand, forty six thousand dollars income. You know, it's <laughs> yes. Yeah. The, yeah, these he helps you with the down payment, but but from what we've seen, down payment has not been the problem. It hasn't been the problem. That's the DPA. You can you can you can give a DPA all you want, but if you can't afford the house, it doesn't help at all. Right. Yeah. Hello, <laughs> Jackie. Welcome. Well, Pat, tell us what happened with rates this week because, as expected, by many, not all, uh, we didn't think that rates would move. Right, Jason? <laughs> yeah. It's just the it's, feds didn't touch a thing. Yeah. I know, they, it's I a mean, lot, they, of, uh, lot of chatter. A lot of chatter and nothing happening. Yep, a lot of uh, a lot of built up demand or a lot of speculation starting last week. You know, last week it was like, "Ooh, next week the BLS numbers are coming out." And you know, the last three days we've seen. I mean, we've saw. Here's the price we've got. Let me just pull this up here. I mean, this is bomb prices, but we had a low. Uh, basically, on it was on Tuesday we had a low, and then the last three days have been a nice day for the bond market. We've made up about 130. I give or take 120, 130 basis points on price, give or take. So, I mean, we've had a nice run the last three days. But once again, um, you know, I'm looking at rates, you know, they're mid sevens. They've come down a little bit. They're peaking around the high, you know, high sevens. But, um, you know, looking at these articles, once again, we talked about a bifurcated market. Here you got the um, vice chairman for the Roger Ferguson for the Federal Reserve, or he's the former Federal Reserve vice chairman. Inflation has become incredibly unpredictable. <laughs> and then there's another article here out of MBS Live talking about Goolsby. He's a actually he's a current Fed chair or uh, partner, Fed Reserve. And he said, you know, his his point is um, Fed is trying to assess if recent hot inflation readings mean economy is overheating. And he goes on the article saying everybody's just trying to take a step back and try to figure out. Is that a sign that the economy is overheating or is that a sign of something else, something other, some other thing? So, you know, you and I talked about this before the, you know, for a couple minutes, Rick, nobody knows what's really going on. Right, Jason? <laughs> they can predict it all they want. Yeah, it's, it seems it goes down, you know, the rates or rates wise, rates go up a quarter point over a week or two. And then there's some report and then they go back down a quarter point over a week or two, like. I actually don't mind this. This this is very stable rates. Reminds me a yeah. lot of the 2000s. The early 2000s, I mean, I think rates were between 6 and 8% for like 5, 6 years. That was, you yeah. know, it, it's nice if everybody's not having to freak out and worry that they're going to have an, their payment's going to jump by three, $400 or even more, you know, one month to the next. Well, we're now we're in this like I think you're in you know the, the psychology of the market's been obviously last year and a half before this we had people like 
now, you know, like rates were just going up, 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 and people were just, it was unstable. Nope, nobody could move. They didn't know if I sell my house today and the rates are at five and I sell my house and want to buy it, the rates might be seven in another month. So that that created a lot of instability. Instability. Now, come on, guys. We all know that rates are going to go down because it's an election year. I've read it again on Facebook and uh, in, in Twitter. And I do have I do have Twitter. And I'm sure it's out there on TikTok. It, it's an election year. The Chairman Powell is going to lower rates because it's an election year. And uh, and that's all there is to it. What say you? Because I'm about to show you something. Yeah. <laughs> oh, if you want to show something. I do have some other interesting. I had a really cool phone call just before your show started with uh, someone. I'd love to share their information. Okay, cool. Well, look at this. Is Over the we'll, we'll come back to that. So hold that thought. Over the past eight presidential election cycles, the Fed has raised its target rate in three of those years. Raised them. Does that mean they wanted to get the current guy out? 2000, 2004, and 2016. And lowered its target rate in 92, 2008, and 2020. So they lowered it in 2020. Did they do that because they wanted to keep Trump in? Same guy. Um, yeah. Yes, I'm getting political here in case anybody's asking. We'll ignore the small decrease at the very beginning of 96, but the Fed made significant changes to interest rates in the second half of election years in only in 2004 and 2008. So they they raised the the Fed in 2004 raised rates during the fall campaign season, the shaded area here. So without boring you too much on the detail there's not been any correlation. There hasn't been yeah. any trend or anything. It, it is what it is. So tell me about your phone call. No, that's a good, that's good to show that. Yeah. That's just bogus to even give any energy to that. If, if they've raised them, you know, 50% of the time and lowered them 50% of the time. So it's just what part of the cycle they're in. I was talking with uh, the, uh, the head sales manager of one of the largest, I'll call it a hard money lender, but they, they're a hard money lender, but they lend on all kinds of different levels up here in the Seattle area. And they lend, they, it's privately funded by, they're probably billionaires now. I, I used to know a couple of them back when I would borrow money from them. <laughs> you can borrow money in 24 hours from them um, at, you know, can you guys still hear me? Yeah, yep. yeah. Oh, it look, it's frozen on my end. I wonder if it's me. Oh, you can still hear you. Yeah, it must be you. Let me send you. Anyway, a, so just out of the, we were talking about different things and we kind of talked about 2022 and they don't like holding loans for more. They really don't like holding loans for more than nine months, sometimes 12 up to 18. And he said he's getting a, a ton of input that these investors who bought properties to rehab, subdivide and put a detached dwelling, all of those things, they were making their financial decisions um, a year or two ago based on four or 5% interest rates. And he said, they've now held on. He said, they're getting a lot of calls that they're, these people are selling their properties. So I think we're actually, we're going to have at least up here, a, a inventory surge that's going to be coming. And it's mostly because people bought these properties to do things with, planned on refinancing them into a conventional 70, 80% loan to value, right? Keep it as a long-term rental, whatever. Mm -hmm. The interest rates just don't make sense anymore. I've I've seen some eight, nine hundred thousand dollar houses up here and they struggle to get 3,500 to 3,800 rent. You're like, well, to buy the thing would be six, 7,000. So yeah. somebody there is not making money or not making the money they thought or whatnot. So yeah, what's your thoughts on that, Pat? Uh, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people... Uh, what are my thoughts? Um, yeah, I can see that happening. I mean, I think you look at the numbers. I'm kind of a, a numbers guy, but also I'm a psychology guy because, you know, as I say, remember, what was my saying, Rick? You, know, you look at numbers, numbers turn into, you know, this, and then this turns into trends and, tre and trends. You know, you can see the psychology of it. You yeah, can see that mind, I'm old. I don't have much of a memory. I can't remember what I had. A, I had a, I had a saying. Was I, was a good line, though. I, know, I remember that saying. It was good. <laughs> yeah, it was like trends turn into this, and then it turns into a you know psychiatrist. Yeah, I have to go back. I for some reason I can't remember. I had it down pat, and I made it up myself. But you have to look at psychology too. And now that they got caught up in that, you know, they they looked at the numbers, but that 
you know that the psychology of all those investors, there are going to be that batch. That market's got to be crazy. You think that you're going to buy a seven, eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollar house on hard money and be able to rent it out? That just that just that goes from being a, a good businessman to just stupidity. Yeah, that's herd mentality. I mean, no, you know, not, does that? I mean, I hate to be so harsh, but is that? I mean, you know, that's where well, the psychology. They, well, they, they got him for two, three hundred thousand under value. Because I actually know a couple guys. I've been talking with. Oh, them really? Okay. How, how we can get them out of the property? So they basically were. They, they've done good equity wise because the market has stayed really strong, right? So yeah, they, they bought out houses that had issues, but their plan was to keep the house. But now they Every can't because the hard money. The hard money is between 10 and 13 percent. And you can only bleed that for so long and go, well, I've just got to sell the property. I'm, I can't convert it into a rental. I've got a yeah. renter in there paying me five. But if if I convert it over, it's going to convert over to a seven, eight thousand dollar payment. So I think I think there's going to be some pressure on sellers finally to sell after we've talked about that for a few years with you guys. Right. Like, how do you force sellers to sell? Yeah. You know, and it's not going to be the people that have a 50% loan to value and a 2.75. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're going to hand that house off to their kids, most likely. Or rent, or rent yeah. it out, you know, rent it out there. Well, it'll, yeah. it'll be when the math doesn't work for the investors anymore is what I'm hearing. Yeah. And some yeah. of them got in thinking, you know, I mean, they still made a hundred thousand maybe on their flip or whatever, if they get out now. But yeah. the, the mentality with them is really shifting. They've given up waiting to convert over to some five, six percent loans because they're just not coming. Interesting. Yeah, we Rick, we haven't seen a lot. I mean, we've seen with Airbnbs down here, but it didn't seem like it got crazy, crazy. I mean, it's crazy, but not overheated to a certain degree, would you say? Yeah, and Airbnbs <coughs> are a hyper regional issue. Sedona saturated. Yeah. So <laughs> Excuse me. Everybody ran there to get an Airbnb. Well, speaking of psychology, though, Rick and Jason, I mean, you know, it was like, look at the psychology of the interest rate, the Fed watch. I mean, back before red, the Fed started, you know, rap, um, running the rates up, we had this this run up that now it's I, I, I said at the beginning of the year, this could be the year of the Fed rate, you know, Federal Reserve rate watch. You know, what's going to happen with Federal Reserve month to month to month? And now you got a psychology. Everybody's trying to beat up everybody. Like how many rate cuts are we going to see? I, you know, the, the economy has been moving along. I, that's the market's going to be flip flopping every couple of weeks based on this data now. And it's just, um, and I'm seeing we're all, waiting, we're all waiting for something. Well, you know, the problem is what people don't understand is by the time that, you know, Jason, correct me if I'm wrong, but by the time the Fed does something, it's already been built in the market. The, the, the day to day treasury rates, the mortgage backed security rates are going to determine. How the market? That's your market, because when the yeah. Fed does something, it, it's already been built into it. Obviously, obviously, people knew that the jobs report today was going to be what it was because the bond market had a couple crazy, real positive days a couple days ago. So those who knew that it was going to be yeah. a weak jobs report, it already the bond market reacted a couple days yeah. ago. You're exactly right. Well, yeah, I had actually got a couple of people. I've been locked, you know, based on obviously April 10th, we had a you know a slap around day, uh, but. The way I was looking at the, you know, and I had a couple of people I was going to lock lock for, but I looked at, I was watching the trading day to day. And I'm like, the Wednesday and Thursday, I said, if this could be really bad news, we would have already been seeing it. And it was acting positively. I'm like, I have a feeling it's going to be positive. And just the way it was trading, day, just just a couple of days before, you could see the day to day, the interactions. It's kind of fun to watch that. Got a um, <clears throat> comment here from, Subscriber, I got a decent amount of new listing emails this week with houses in the 200 300,000 range. Could be flippers. Uh, where are you seeing those? Yeah, um, be interested. Um, <clears throat> hey, Rick, have you run into any sellers not offering a piece of the pie for your buyer's agents yet? Yes, believe it or not, I saw a couple with the uh, three day people, 72 sold, offering a big goose egg already. Um, <clears throat> that's changing. A lot. In fact, the requirements that they said were coming in mid-July, they announced today. And Lou here says Glendale. They announced today the changes won't go into effect until August 24th. So, and there's still, still a lot of misinformation. You're probably hearing that up there too, Jason, right? Everybody's wigging out. You know, buyer's agents are not going to get paid. They're 
going to be. Yeah, we just had we had something really strange go down, and I didn't dig deep on it, but those. So I'm actually uh, I joined a team that actually allows you to be on both sides, which is really nice. So I'm a real estate agent with Skyline Properties up here, which is kind of a boutique little. And then I also um, and my license is hung with PRMG for the lending side. So that's kind of how I have a lot of information on both sides. But Skyline just came out with an emergency message this morning um, that there's a new form that they are telling basically every agent to get signed before you show the people a house. Um, they, they already have two agents. These people wrote up houses and somehow they went to to attorneys and are already, I mean, it's like they're not going to get paid and there's not a leg to stand on unless, um, unless you get this signed up front. Well, good timing on that. In fact, uh, you, I, can you, I can send you a link to it maybe, you know, later <laughs> and you can look at it if it's interesting to make a show about. Well, I have the Zillow seven day touring agreement. So they require us to have. In, but this isn't until August, guys. They're going to require us to have an agreement with buyers so buyers know, you know, what's the deal here. And so, so Zillow added a form, and it's generic. And now every state and every broker, um, and, and even the NAR said, you know, we're going to require that you have an agreement, but we're not going to tell you how to draft the agreement. So they're not going to get involved in that. Here's Zillow's, and it's, and I apologize because it's kind of tiny but it's called a touring agreement. And it says, you know, the agreements between you and, 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 the, and the buyer. The sole purpose of the agreement is for the broker to consult with the buyer regarding specific properties and assist buyer in locating and touring properties. These activities collectively constitute the touring service. In other words, they are going to work with you. Buyer and broker both agree they are not entering into agency relationship. They are not a client yet. They're just agreeing to tour with you for one week. So it's kind of like date the agent first. <laughs> well, they're not they're dating uh, an Come on. <laughs> it sounds, sounds, like, my, sounds like my dating. It yeah. sounds like my dating life. Uh, yeah, seven day. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's turning into one. Of, so basically, showing houses is going to be like a dating app now. Okay, that's yeah, right. that's <laughs> right. So yeah. So two, there's buyer acknowledgement. Buyer represents that the buyer has not signed an exclusive buyer brokerage agreement for the location with another broker. Those are two critical things because you usually have to ask when you get the phone call. Well, are you currently working with another agent? Yeah, but but he's at the beach. So th this. This just clarifies things. Now it's for one week. You can, this agreement shall be entered into on this day and expire in seven days. You can change that. If you want to go look at house just on Saturday and Sunday with me, great. Okay. We'll drop a, an agreement for, you know, two days. Um, so, and look who's here. We got Jessica is joining us. She figured out she can do it on her phone. How are you? I'm good. How are you guys? Good. We're uh, just going over the new Zillow form here, and we're saying that there's no fee for the touring services. I'm now, dying. You just said dating your agent. Yeah. So know, I'm yeah. thinking out of all of us, I have a good shot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, they have, they have filters that can make me look, you know, 20 years younger. So <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, meet Jason. So hi, Jason. Hi, Jessica. So, so this form came out, and, and kudos to Zillow for coming out with it as quick as they did. But, but now the other form that will come up will say something along the line of, you agree to work with, we're going to work together. Now you're going to be a client. If So you're going to have to have an agreement. What if the seller does not offer any compensation? Okay. Um, then you guys have to come to an agreement. How are you going to handle that? Are you going to pay for it as a buyer? Um, what are we going to do going forward so that there's transparency in, in the whole thing? But remember, there's always a date to it. So you can you can extend this out. Uh, imagine how much money we'd make as realtors if we literally had been charging for every showing because we get accused of well, all you guys do is unlock homes. Well, if I charge you 50 bucks for every home I unlock, um, I'd probably have as much money as Pat. <laughs> <laughs> I was spending well, on gas. Like yeah. Lenar is known for offering zero 
dollars for a fixed rate. My builder has now had conversations about reducing it from our current 3% coal broke commission. They're keeping an eye on it. Lennar is also famous for going up and down like a yo-yo, right, Jessica? Yes. Oh, yes. They pay, they I, don't pay, they pay. Mm -hmm. Yep. And they're on flat fee in most of the East Valley cities right now. It's just flat. Doesn't matter the price of the home. They're just going to give nope. you X amount of dollars. So yeah. uh, it, it seems to be, it. yeah, lower prices homes, lower price on the payout. It's going to be, um, they're, now they've, everybody's getting all ready for July. And then today they come out and go, nope, August. Um, there's still some lawsuits out there too. EXP is being sued as well. They think they can negotiate their way out of it. Jackie said the going rate for my buyer agents is $35 a home. I never passed. I never passed that on. So they're, they're saying for, for showings, Jackie, 35 oh, so, bucks a home. So does Jack, does Jackie pay people who I see those people up here, they offer about 50 per home. Like they'll say, uh, you know, I, I'm, I can't make it happen. Can you please show my buyers to these two, you know, homes in this area today, $100 for two home showings. So, okay. So that's yeah, what it, it's, it's between 35 and 50 here. Plus we have a service called show Amy where you can sign up for it as an agent. And so people can um, call me and go, <clears throat> Rick, I want to see a home. And I go, well, I'm not available, but let me schedule somebody with you. I found that to be the most unreliable app I've ever seen in my life. You don't know who they are. And when they don't show up, they don't even call and tell you. They don't, they just, so you had to make it and then have the person say, yeah, I'll do it. Then you had to call them and go, okay, look, dude, <laughs> you better let me know if you're not going to make it. Um, Cause it, it was a great, I lost a couple of clients over that. Um, Jackie says, when I'm overbooked, I have three agents. I use as backup. And Jackie is uh, typing with one hand as we all know. <laughs> Got that. Hey, can I ask oh. one favor? Uh, Rick? Sure. Can you go back to the second chart you started the show with? Because I have a question. You you use that chart a lot. It's the one where it looks like a heartbeat rate, baby blue line and dark blue line. It's the it's the new listings and under contract. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> looks like a heart pulse rate. You mean my seven day moving average? This one. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's, can, actually, uh, that's actually my EKG. Um, <laughs> yeah you can see when the market's not good there you almost you almost flatline yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> how many weeks is this covering on the screen right now oh boy um because it's more than 52 it's yeah it's right. more than 52 um i can i can cheat here let me see i just i just, I just always wondered because i would i would like to compare Right now, it's going from February of last year to today. Oh, okay. So you got about 14 months in there. Okay. Yeah. I changed the beginning quite a bit because otherwise it's a really long chart. Yeah. I just wondered how. So, yeah. So, your guys is act. So, you guys aren't even experiencing down activity year over year, are you? No. You know, like, you're actually up. Yeah. See, we're. We lost about 20% from 2022 to 2023, and then we're down about another 5 to 10% in actual closings. And so that that's what's making our inventory really start to take off here because, you know, we're only getting maybe 5% inventory increases, but when you have demand, you know, sloughing off. Um, and I mean, it, it's just all about the payment. Is Do you see that a lot, Pat? Like, do you have a lot of buyers? I'd say 80% of our buyers need interest rates to drop a point and a half or houses to drop 50 to a hundred thousand. Like, you know, I don't know. I don't want to call it flood, floodgates, but then they'd all be yeah. able to buy They're That's where yeah, the majority I, of our the last year, buy. last year, I, I, the people I've been getting like were Jessica and other people who refer to me, um, you know, for the most part, they've been able, there's only been a few tight situations where I've been close to DTI, but most of them have been, you know, the payments are, you know, 20, you know, the mid two thousands, 26, 27, 3000 range. So they're paying rent of 23, 2400. They're like, okay, I haven't had too many people like saying, I can't, I, at least I haven't, I know people have like, yeah, I got to wait for rates to drop a half or three quarters point before I buy, um, you know, just from a financial standpoint, psychologically, they would like to, but I've been telling them right now with rates where they're at, 
you're not getting a lot of demand. You know, if we do see rates, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, marry the rate, you know, date the rate and marry the, whatever, marry the house. But, you know, if we do see it, I try to run different scenarios. Like if, if a rate gets down to here, here's what you're, you know, if, if we were to have a, a target rate of say high fives, I think eventually we could get to the high fives. I think that's kind of the, seems like it's a median range, low sixes, high fives eventually. But I try to say, Hey, this is what your payment would be. But answer your question. Most people are like, okay, it's going to hurt for a bit, but we can still afford it. But up there, you're, you know, I don't, my typical buyer is 350 to 750 range. You know, yeah, we just, um, I'm surprised have, how much. Hmm? Oh, 10%. I'd say 10% of our inventory is under 450. And so everybody that can afford 3000 and under is just, they either have to move into a dump if, or they yeah. just, they, there's no, there's just no inventory available. Yeah, like, you know, I, but sorry, I, I didn't mean know, to break off. You know, the, the people that I've been dealing with have been, I mean, I've been pretty amazed and pretty, uh, not astonished, but the younger generation, 25 to 35, it seems like they took a lot of good financial advice from their parents because, you know, I'm running into a lot of people that have their stuff together. You know, they don't have any student debt. If they don't have any debt, they're good to go. Um, you know, exactly. it's just, yeah, that, it, it seems to me like that, the car payments, the biggest the car payments, the biggest thing that, you know, slaps people around. I got two cars, one car payment, 800, one of a thousand. And, uh, but if they don't have any debt, they're, they're ready to go. I just talked to a couple about three weeks ago that were about 30 years old. They had $120,000 to put down on a $600,000 house. So it, they're coming out of the oh. woodwork. In, in a related topic, you know, Congress is now trying to write some legislation to stop people like BlackRock from buying up a bunch of homes and holding them. So they're trying to pass this legislation to stop them from buying. And my little simple head says, well, how about if you give them a break on capital gains for the next ten, two years for them to offload some of the properties? Wouldn't that have a greater impact on supply than trying to squeeze them to not buy? Because that's going to make them hold on to their rentals even longer. But I'm just a proponent of saying, hey, for two years, if you want to unload your, your, you know, sell your rentals, um, we're going to give you a capital gains holiday. Are you talking about giving the, the institution a, a ca capital gains holiday? Yeah. Right. But even just give it, give it to everybody. And then that the small guy wins. That's a great idea. Like, I mean, yeah, I, I disagree. <laughs> the government I, will never do that. I just think. Yeah, but you know, if you if give it, it to every, if you give it to all of them, and you could put some minor limits, but instead of making all these crazy rules, think how much inventory that would free up. People yeah. who are planning on selling in three or four years and knowing that they're going to have to hand over a hundred thousand of their three hundred thousand gain or sell today. I like the idea. The window's closing. You know, maybe even give them it's 100 percent, you know, no tax now, you know, a year from now, it's 50 percent of tax. And in two years, you know, you're back to paying all the capital gains tax when you sell this thing. Well, Biden's proposal now in his budget is to raise the capital gains tax to 46 percent. Canada is implementing a 60 percent capital gains rate. So they always punish, punish, punish to try and solve a problem right instead of saying, well, let me give you a break here. <laughs> And yeah. not only that, you'll get to keep your money and the, therefore there'll be more consuming going on. And, and, you know, it just, they exactly. just don't operate that way. Well, I think, I think so, quite frankly, I'm running for election. Not to be, uh, you know, <laughs> point counterpoint, Jane, you know, but, yeah. but, um, <laughs> Pat, you ignorant, you ignorant uh, person. You um, remember Pat, Pat's the one that won the dollar. He was, yeah. he knew rates were going to go to 5.99 one day. Yep, in exactly. Well, Jason, I, I know how to solve that. I, I I am the controller of the mouse. So see how well that works. So <laughs> so if he starts bringing up that he won the dollar, he's yeah, there. You go. Well, you know, no, I, I want to I, hear, hear that. I want to hear his counterpoint. Yeah. Yeah. No, my personal opinion is you don't give it to the Black Rocks. You give it to the individuals. The black, the institutions, you know, have had their run. They've had their made their money. Give it to the Jim and Jane Wilson's uh, Smiths of the world, that type of loosen it up there. I mean, because I think you'll see a lot of black, you know, the black rocks. I don't know about up in your market, Jason, if the institutions have been heavy. I, I'm kind of jumping around asking questions and answering a question, but uh, as I always do. But I don't know if the institutions have been heavily up there, but they have been down here. And I think you give it to the 
you know, the the mom pop mom and pop people, the institutions give them a break, but not as much of a, a break as well, say. That's what, yeah, yeah, you have the fan with that. This is what calm mom said, right? What about Airbnbs and mom and pop rentals? Yeah, so. yeah. So I mean, give the mom and pop. I mean, I I per, my personal opinion is, I mean, I have this. Uh, we talked to another loan officer, Randy Bongard, with our office, and he's he's a big uh, just hates when the institutions come in he thinks I, institutions should not be able to buy i mean a home because and i my feeling is they look at it as an asset a home is a different asset it's an asset but it's a different asset class you can't live in a stock and buy you know they've got to separate that i mean i i just think that they're i got a big problem with institutions coming in and throwing all their money around that's just my personal opinion because like you said it should be a separate asset class because you can't live in a stock and bond. You can do all your trading there, but don't, don't, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm looking for a word, but just don't shake up the housing market like they have. I don't know. Does that make sense? I, yeah. You yeah. know, I agree with you. I, I would say a th back when I had rentals and was buying houses to flip, it, one out of 20 homes was bought by one of these institutional companies. I don't think we have BlackRock very much here. We have a couple other companies but now when you pull up any rental i would say 30 percent or more of the rentals are owned by these big corporations one of them is or llc's homes. or llc's yeah but here but here's the crazy thing that so to them they can buy a house and not put a renter in and it's almost yeah. as profitable as having it as a rental because they get the depreciation write-off so they literally get to park their money, you know, whereas an individual, if you bought a house, go, oh, I'm going to buy a rental. Oh, what are you going to do with it? I'm going to keep it empty because it's going to help me on my taxes, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're able to control the market and have empty homes. It's, yeah. it's not right. I agree. I just think it just, it just, uh, it, it just, it's, um, uh, I'm lost at words right now. Cause I just think it's a different asset class that institutions should not be playing around and you're playing around with people's lives and they have just totally, you know, discombobulated the market with this big institutional money. And I just, from a personal standpoint, I just don't think it's right because it's, it, it's an asset, but I think it's a, you got to classify as a different asset class. So that's my two cents worth. So. Well, again, for me, it just boils down to <clears throat> stop trying to figure out more ways to punish the process. Yeah. Yeah. Try well, just for once in your life, stepping back and maybe giving people a break, uh, but that's not in their DNA. Well, they could and, uh, they could have a run. They could try for, you know, uh, 24 to 24 months and at least loosen up something. It would be a move in the right direction to help some. And because bottom line is, Jason knows this, what, what we're dealing with is a pure supply-demand equation, pure supply and demand across the board. Yeah, if we could get an extra 2 million homes on the market today or in – and I'm not trying to crush the market and make people feel bad, but the prices would come down 10 to 20% across the country and just make life way more affordable for everyone. Right. Yeah. Yep. You know? yep. Well, we're going to have to do something. Cause here's my favorite chart right here. It's the debt clock interest on the debts, 819 versus defense 885. We're almost surpassing that, but we are collecting record revenue, U S federal tax revenue. So our problem is, spending so don't tell me you can't give a few investors a tax break for a couple of years so because it won't it won't hurt us right jessica right <laughs> <laughs> she's got the best office of all of us now right there so, i know yeah i know i want to get outside this is uh, supposed to be been, our last uh, day. Your, your last nice day so going yeah back to, I, going uh, back to green for a few days Oh, well, so I, uh, Jessica, this is yeah. what you're seeing up in Gilbert. You're trying to get that house for one of our clients here. And here's what you're seeing in supply. There's an advantage for sellers. The market index is, uh, is pretty good. The demand index is below between about 72. And so it's, there's a little bit more of an advantage for sellers in Gilbert than there is in places like, you know, Queen Creek, uh, where it's, pretty bleak for for sellers but uh are you feeling that out there now when you're writing an offer uh absolutely i've pulled new listings every day the last week and we're 
we're still at three <laughs> that fit yeah. the criteria. Nothing new for the weekend. Uh, yeah. Chandler's about the same way too. Yeah. I was laughing earlier in the show that, you know, I saw a post that said that our, our new listings were up $800 uh, today. And I, no, they're not. And then I saw the post was down. Uh, but because we're only up 100 for the week. Uh, Jackie says, I think 15 days, all listings owner occupied only, but that would never happen. Yeah. With, you know, nobody asked us. Yeah. <laughs> That's just the way, you know, maybe, maybe. Well, we'll maybe we say, we need to send uh we need to send that letter. Like we did uh, when we told them to drop the rates. Remember that handwritten note that we sent them and they did. Yeah, drop we the sent rate. Jerome Powell. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we can send, <laughs> or would we send that to the president or, um, well, I'll, look, get I'll your community to work on that, Pat. Well, how about let her out next week? And and again, you know, handwrite it so that it yeah. looks personal, like the one we did with, with Chairman Powell, because that made all the difference. Jason, in the world. did you see that letter we wrote? No, uh, no. it's pretty funny. <laughs> That's awesome, though. I, th I think we should. We should flood their. That's a good idea. Do a whole bunch of handwritten and send them all off at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just just encourage our audience. Uh, uh, flag the minute where we started talking about this tax relief and send it to your Senator. Yeah. So I could idea. use the views. <laughs> 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 well, gang, I appreciate you guys all coming on and joining us here today, Jason, especially coming from the wet Northwest and Jessica, you know, contrasting your weather by basking in the sun out there. And, uh, you know, she, she would have done it in her kitchen, but she knew that you'd feel real bad if she was outside. So <laughs> it was a good introduction, though. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> got to bring the best to the table. <laughs> That's right. Come on, Jason. All right. See you guys. Have a great weekend. Right. Take care. All right. Thanks a lot, Jason. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.